So without further ado, it's a real pleasure to have Dan Fried speak in our virtual seminar series on boundaries and three-dimensional topological field theories. Take it away, Dan. All right, well, thanks. And thanks everyone for coming. Um, so this is, as the slide says, joint work with Konstantin Telemann. And uh, I'm I wrote slides today since there are lots of pictures and I wanna give some context to the theorem. So I'm going to give some background and context and then state the theorem, give a couple of uh, consequences, and then we'll take a look a little bit at how it's proved or some techniques. So the main idea, as it says, is boundaries. And let me start with the idea of boundaries in a classical context. And so this is the idea of boundary conditions for PDEs, in this case, elliptic PDEs. And so here we have the Laplace operator. It's a second order operator. And we can look at it on the disk, just the unit disk in the plane. It's an elliptic operator, but the disk, while compact, is uh, a manifold with boundary. So for example, the space of solutions is infinite dimensional unless you impose some boundary conditions. And there are boundary conditions, for example, these Dirichlet boundary conditions, where you ask for a space of functions which vanish pointwise on the boundary. So that's a boundary condition that you can check locally, meaning in this case, you just need the value of the function at a point. You might have other boundary conditions that depend on a finite number of derivatives. Well, that's a second order elliptic operator. And if we come to a first order operator on that same disk, thought of now in the complex line, we have the cauchy riemann operator, the d-bar operator. And it's a, of course, that also has an infinite dimensional kernel, all the holomorphic functions on the disk, those form an infinite dimensional vector space. And there's a classical theorem, which says that there are no local elliptic boundary conditions. So, this was actually the jumping off point for famous work of Atiyah, Patodi, and Singer in the late 70s when they found a new kind of boundary condition for this D-bar operator and its generalizations, Dirac operators, but uh, that's not the concern today. The right analog here is these local elliptic conditions and this theorem that says there are none. And as it says, Atiyah bot, it should say Singer as well really, um, found a topological proof of that and a vast generalization. So the theorem that I wanna to discuss today, the main theorem is a kind of quantum version of that, a specific situation in quantum theory where there are no boundary conditions. Quantum theory being linear, it means there's always a zero boundary condition, but it means there are no non, there are no non zero ones. Okay, and just a word about the word conditions. In classical PDE, usually it's a condition as it is here. We gave a condition on the function, but you could imagine a system where you have new functions on the boundary and you have a condition that couples the new functions with the restrictions of the old ones. In that case, you would have boundary data rather than simply boundary conditions. And that's really the right thing to think about in the quantum case. So this next slide is the only slide of the talk that's can I, not- Can I stop you? Yeah. Uh, so the, this operator is elliptic. So what do you mean by local elliptic boundary? What's the? Local means that um, I can check the boundary condition by at each point by just knowing a finite jet of the function at that point. But let's say I say no bound, like empty boundary condition, then I have an elliptic operator. So what is the condition? Well, but yes, but you don't have the properties that elliptic operators have on closed manifolds, for example, a finite dimensional kernel. So an elliptic boundary condition is one that gives you the properties as if you're on a compact manifold. So maybe if we can defer, for, since this was just an analogy, we can talk about it after in the tea room. I'm happy to talk at length, but this is a little bit orthogonal to okay. the talk, if that's okay. Yeah? Okay. So let's, uh, just to get a feel for what a boundary theory means in, in a quantum field theory, or, uh, yeah, a quantum field theory, let's look at the simplest case of quantum mechanics. So here I've written a quantum mechanical system the way we write all topological field theories as a functor from a Bordism category to something linear. 
in this case, just vector spaces, but the vector spaces might be infinite dimensional, so you should think topological vector spaces. Again, it's not important for this, any details about what those mean. I will specify in the case we need uh, the details. Here it's one dimensional, meaning zero and one manifolds, the Riemannian and they're oriented. And so, for example, a quantum mechanical theory takes a point and gives you a vector space, usually called the Hilbert space of states. And if we have the interval with a Riemannian metric of length tau, then this maps to the evolution uh, on that of the states through time tau. Here we have the, um, that I is a misprint. Gosh. Um, here we have the, uh, here we have the uh, wick rotated um, ev time evolution. Okay, so that's just a kind of cartoon of what quantum mechanics is. And what is a boundary data in this case? Well, one possible boundary data is to give a vector in the, um, in the vector space, a state, or we could give a functional on the vector space. And so if we take this interval here and we put for example, this vector on the left endpoint, then what does it evaluate to? Well, you should think of the boundary theory, and it's the same in a sense in the classical uh, elliptic context, is coning off the boundary. It's making the boundary as if it weren't there. In this uh, version of field theory, we can do that in the Bordism category just geometrically. That green dot is really a cone on a point, and it's so the boundary of this one manifold is really just this right endpoint. In other words, in the Bordism category, you should read this as a one morphism from the empty zero manifold to a point. And so if we evaluate this functor F, but now an extension to allow these boundaries, if we evaluate that, we should just get an element in the vector space of a point. That is to say an element of H. And the element is, of course, the element we get by simply evaluating that time evolution. Is the eye, is the eye still a misprint there? Or? The eye is very much a misprint, thank you. So yeah. it's non, the thing is non-unitary is what you're saying. It's wick rotated. So this is, yeah, that's, you should think of these Riemannian intervals as wick rotated. So it's, um, it, it's the contraction uh, we get by putting imaginary time in the unitary evolution. In any case, the, the thing I want to focus on, as I said, are the boundaries. So putting in that boundary evaluates on Xi. If I put in the boundary on the right, then we just apply theta. And if we put in boundaries on both sides, well, then that interval should be read as closed. That has no boundary. In the Bordism category, it's a one morphism from the empty zero manifold to itself. So it's like a closed one manifold. Therefore, in the field theory, it should evaluate to a, to a number. And the number, of course, is just the pairing of the evolution of the vector xi with the functional theta. Okay, so that gives you a feel for putting in boundaries. It's an expansion of the boundary category, of the Bordism category to include boundaries. That's what that symbol means. And it's just a functor out of that, which extends the given functor. So the definition is much more geometric in a way than it is in classical PDE. All right, now let me give you a, uh, oops, one more comment that you should, even though in this quantum mechanics example, of course, these boundaries are boundaries in time, you should intuitively think that the boundaries we're using are boundaries in space rather than time. Time and space <clears throat> in this wick rotated version aren't really there, so that's just a kind of philosophical uh, point of view. There's another typo, the, there's a plus minus for the third bordism since you're reading it from two points to the empty set? Well, uh, no. Uh, is, is plus an orientation or what does it mean? Plus means the orientation. Well, so if you go- well, I'll explain the blue and red arrows in a little bit, but the blue arrow is talking about the orientation and the red arrow is whether it's incoming or outgoing, if you like. A kind of arrow of time. From two points to the empty set, one of them should be a minus point. I understand. Um, okay. Um, maybe that's a typo. 
I, um, I, I don't think so, though, because you see, in this diagram, I think you'll be happy that that's the identity map in the Bordism category on the plus point. Sure. And all I've done is put boundary conditions. They're different types, uh, this green and this orange, but I put one on the left and one on the right. And I think, I think it's still should oh, be. I see. So you're not reading it as a morphism from, it's still a morphism from point to point. I'm trying well, to once, well, that's important. Once you put the boundary theory, it's as if when I put the boundary here, this is neither incoming nor outgoing. You see, uh -huh. that's as if it's closed. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand this new bordism category, the one comma delta. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'll say a little bit more when I get to more precise things. But in this talk, I'm not going to have a chance to, you know, spell it out. I mean, in the paper, of course, we spell out something precise. But I'll say a little bit more. But yes, that's a good question. Thanks. Any other questions before I go on? Okay, so here's a toy example of the kind of theorem we prove. So this is again a one-dimensional theory, but now it's a topological theory. So the manifolds don't have any metrics or anything like that. It's uh, DC just stands for double cover. And so the objects are zero manifolds together with a double cover. That's what's indicated here. And we have a field theory F. It happens to be invertible, so it assigns to this, um, to this configuration, it assigns just the complex line, one-dimensional complex vector space. But this object in the Bordism category has the, an, a, the cyclic symmetry of order two, right? It has a self-symmetry. So that self-symmetry has to act on the value of the field theory. And it's our choice to define the theory, and I choose the non-trivial action, in other words, the sign representation. And, um, okay, so now let's suppose that we have a boundary theory of the type before, so this green dot. Well, so now we have a one morphism like this, which has nothing incoming, but it has, again, this outgoing thing. So when I evaluate that, this should give me an element in this vector space C. But because this whole one boardism is invariant, it has a symmetry of that twist, that element has to be invariant under the action of the group on the complex vector space. In other words, it has to be invariant under flip of sign. The only possibility, therefore, is that it's zero. So in other words, for this theory, the only possible boundary theory of this type is the zero vector. So this is an example of a theory that has no non-zero boundaries. So it's just to show you, in a very simple example, the kind of phenomenon that we're going to discuss. We're going to look at three-dimensional theories. This is a one-dimensional theory, but morally, it's that type of theorem, okay? The non-existence of boundary theories. All right, so let me then remind you, and it's very familiar to this audience, we've been discussing these kinds of things very much this semester. Uh, the kinds of three-dimensional field theories that we're going to deal with, at least we're going to prove a theorem that axiomatizes the properties of these. So these were introduced in the late 80s from two points of view. One, Witten, starting from the classical chern simons invariant, a beautiful construction in differential geometry. And the second one by Reshtik and Turayev, starting from this algebraic data that had been introduced into conformal field theory already by Moore and Seiberg, this modular tensor category. And the two of them, it was a mystery at the beginning why they, how they fit into one picture, why they gave the same invariance, but they do through this notion of an extended field theory. And so now we have one, two, and three dimensional manifolds extended like that. The codomain is um, a two category of categories. And I'll say in a few slides, um, technically precisely what two category we want to use. And the relation is that this theory on the one hand is to be thought of as a quantization of this classical chern simons invariant. And on the other hand, what's attached to the circle is the modular tensor category. So just because F maps a one manifold to objects in this category, we get a category, a linear category, and then the geometry here of the pair of pants and the braiding uh, exchanges the two inputs is what gives us the, the braiding, of course. So just a remark that um, I took these, the, the codomain to be 
the, the domain rather to be framed manifolds, three frame manifolds. And if we take three frame manifolds, there are actually two three framings on the circle. There's one that bounds and one that doesn't. That's because the fundamental group of SO3 is cyclic of order two. So there are two categories we get by evaluating on the circle. One, the bounding one is the modular tensor category. That's the one for which the pair of pants was drawn, for example. And the other one's a module category over it. Now for the usual theories that one talks about here, you don't need the entire framing. You need some, it factors through a quotient. And in that quotient, you don't have two different circles. But um, if you do what's called spin churn Simons or theories like that, then you might need the two circles. In any case, we won't worry about that in this talk. So the problem we want to address is given a theory F of this type, we have to say precisely what we mean, then does it admit a non-zero boundary theory? So after we get to the statement of the theorem, I'll give some motivation for why one might ask such a question. But for now, we're asking this question that uh, I motivated through the classical analog, say. Okay. Well, <clears throat> this theory, as I said, is not quite fully extended. It's extended to one, two, and three manifolds, but we know <clears throat> we have much more powerful tools if it's fully extended. And so here is the fully extended. I wrote it in n dimensions. So we have the Bordism category in fully extended to n dimensions. Now we don't have an obvious target n category. And so we just posit that we have one, a symmetric monoidal n category. And then we have a symmetric monoidal functor F, which is our fully extended theory. And so the theorem, we are going to assume that these Resch-Teek and Turayev theories are fully extended. So we'll assume that there is a codomain C. We'll say a few properties about it. And we'll assume the theory F has been fully extended. Now that's a little bit um, in the future in the sense that Enriquez uh, has done this and other people of course have written a lot about this with conformal nets and lots of different things, but there's no uniform way to do that. So um, perhaps hopefully that will be the subject of, of future work. But, but for today, we're going to assume that we have fully extended. Now I do want to say a warning, and I think it's a bit of a mea culpa because I've certainly been guilty of uh, conflating these ideas in the past. Fully extending the theory down to points, if you like, where you can chop the manifold like that, making it fully local, is an expression of the locality of the theory, that the topological invariants that you're dealing with are completely local. It is not true that when you evaluate the theory on a point that what you get whatever object of C you get, that that's the collection of boundary theories. That is not true. What is the collection of boundary theories is HOM in your category from one to that evaluation on a point. And maybe it's a little bit clearer if you think about the case of a domain wall where you have a theory, say, F on one side and G on the other. And then your domain wall, um, you could think of as a map from say G to F, for example. And so that'll be, if you just use the cobordism hypothesis in a kind of extended form, you evaluate on a point, then you'll get a one morphism from G of a point. So this thing will give you a one morphism from G of a point to, um, to F of a point. And the boundary theory is the case when G is the trivial theory. So it's as if G isn't there, and then you just have the boundary you see mapping to F. And so that's why you, you get HOM, that category of boundary theories by the cobordism hypothesis is really given by HOM from one to F of plus. So it's possible for that to be zero in the linear case or empty in a nonlinear case with that still having an extended theory. So those two notions, it's important not to conflate. And as I said, I've certainly been guilty of doing that. All right, now one kind of target category that one can use for a three-dimensional field theory, topological theory, is a category of tensor categories. And so here I've put a few names. Um, uh, I ran out of room, so I abbreviated some of you perhaps. And um, a lot of these papers are quite recent. So there's the algebraic theory of tensor categories that's been developed 
by, say, Edengoff, Galaki, Nistrik, Ostrik, lots of papers and a book. And then there's putting that in a categorical context. So there are many papers, and of course, we're leaning on all of these. Now, since there are so many experts here, I'm going to give the precise definitions of the categories that we use. So first, we need the category that appeared already a few slides ago of, um, of which linear categories we use. And we'll use the ones that are finitely co-complete. And those have a tensor product, so they, they are a symmetric monoidal uh, category, symmetric monoidal two category. So the objects are these finitely co-complete categories. The one morphisms are right exact functors, and the two morphisms are natural transformations. <clears throat> so I'm going to define, uh, we'll define a tensor category to be simply an algebra object in this category. So that does not assume any internal duals in the tensor category, what's called rigidity, which is often assumed, nor does it assume that the unit in the tensor category is simple. Um, but there it is. So that's uh, a, a tensor category. And then we can make a three category out of the collection of tensor categories. That's called E1 objects. And that's the um, a symmetric monoidal three category. And this linear Kelly tensor product exists. That's how you compose modules in the usual way. You can use a relative version. And then we have a more finite version, which is um, we'll take instead of all of these finitely co-complete categories. So you might think of like vector bundles over a space. Those are you know, kind of big, bigger version of those, bigger among those. We can take much smaller ones, which are finite, semi-simple, and abelian. So those are called FS cap, finite, semi-simple categories. And that's where fusion categories live. And so a fusion category, and this definition is standard, it's a finite semi-simple abelian tensor category, which is also rigid. So it has these internal duals. The only thing that might not be standard is that we're not assuming that the unit is simple. So the unit might be a sum. So an example where the unit is not simple would be to take a category where the objects are two, uh, the objects are two by two um, matrices where the entries of the matrix are vector spaces. And you can just multiply them as you multiply matrices, but you tensor the matrices and take direct sum instead of multiplication and addition. And what is the unit in that case? Well, the unit is just having the scalars on the diagonal, and that's not simple. It's endomorphisms is uh, two copies of the scalars. Okay, and uh, so finally there's a three category, and uh, this three category is sitting inside this three category of tensor categories, which is the cat whose objects are fusion categories. And the morphisms also have to be small. They have to be finite, semi-simple. Abelian, I think. Okay, any questions about that more technical definition? I wanted everyone to know exactly where we're working here. Okay, well, of course- Dan, this is, this is David Ayala. I have a quick question on that previous slide. Sure. It does the, the finiteness, uh, refer to just in the abstract finiteness or as a bimodule in some sense? Oh, this finiteness? Yeah. That means that it's an abelian category, which is finite. So okay, just it has so finitely that. many uh -huh. isomorphism classes of simple objects, etc. Got it, thanks. Sure. Okay, so the main theorem, of course, for fully extended field theories is the cobordism hypothesis. And it says that a theory is determined by its value on a point, a frame theory, on a frame point, standard frame point. And conversely, if that value is, if you give me a fully dualizable object in your category, then you can make a theory. And it says something more about the space of theories, of course. Another version of the cobordism hypothesis, as I alluded to, says that if we have an extension to this bordism category where we are allowing the green boundaries, 
then that extension is determined by the fully dualizable object f of plus together with this one morphism beta of plus. And this also has to be finite inside the target category C. In other words, it has to have all the possible adjoints and so on. So they both obey these strict finiteness conditions that are imposed because those conditions are satisfied in the bordism category. So it's important to know what's dualizable in these targets and we'll need the following two theorems. This one is rather old in various versions, but uh, it says that a two dualizable linear category has to be finite, semi-simple, and abelian. And that's true in our version. And, um, and then we need the theorem that is proved, it's, I think it's fair to say the main theorem, in a paper of Douglas, Schomer, Priest, and Snyder from several years ago, where they proved that if we take this category, three category of fusion categories, and these small bimodules between them, then that category, the word is, the slang is has duals, meaning that every object is fully dualizable, three dualizable, so fusion categories are three dualizable, and all the morphisms have all the adjoints that, um, that they can. Okay, so you see if you combine this theorem, this theorem with uh, the cobordism hypothesis, it tells us that given a fusion category, we can make a three-dimensional framed field theory. And that's indeed what we can do. And those theories go back to Turayev and Vero. Again, not precisely exactly what I'm saying, but let's call it Turayev Vero theories. So we'll call it Turayev Vero theory, this fully extended theory, where the value on a point is a fusion category. And I said that it has a codomain of these tensor categories, but we, it factors through the smaller codomain, in fact, of these fusion categories. And now if we truncate this theory to one, two, and three manifolds, well, it takes values in the part of this category seen by one, two, and three manifolds, which is just our category of categories, and that's an example of a Resch-Tikh and Turayev theory. So these Chern-Simons, or more general Resch-Tikh and Turayev theories, um, have a particular subclass where we can very easily, in a very finite way, extend fully, make it fully local down to points, and the value on a point is a fusion category. So those are called Turayev Vero theories. So in this theory, we can tell what's the modular tensor category. It, everything has to be determined by this phi because the theory is determined by its value on a point. So we have to be able to calculate the value on the circle, which is the modular tensor category from phi, and in fact, it's the Drinfeld center of phi. So these are the theories in which the modular tensor category is a Drinfeld center. And examples among Chern-Simons theories, any Chern-Simons theory for a finite group. So these are finite gauge theories. These include what are called dykeraff witten theories. Those are all of this type. And also for a torus group, there are very special torus theories where you have what's called the level that determines the theory. For special levels, those also are of this type. Okay, so maybe this is a good place to pause for questions. Yes, this is uh, Ezra. Uh, hi, can I ask a question? Um, so um, I think of the um, uh, dacraff witten theories as being associated to a homotopy two type. Uh, are you allowing homotopy three types here now? Um, Well, I think the answer to the question is yes. I mean, if we take uh, even a, you know, in general, a finite homotopy type, we can certainly build a field theory by doing what you might call a finite version of the path integral, right? Yeah. And we could build a theory, we have to decide what the codomain is, but mm -hmm. certainly we could do it in this case into fusion categories. So in other words, your homotopy three type would incorporate what you might call spin churn Simons for finite groups. That's absolutely oh. Okay, yep, thanks. Sure. Other questions? There is a question in the chat. Does Enrique's extension, the way I have it on my screen, it's cut off a little, sorry. Of Chern-Simons fit into this framework as well? 
Well, it's an excellent question. Um, he works with, uh, I forgot what he calls them, commutant by categories or something. So he's working in a slightly different context. So I don't want to say um, that it does or doesn't, but I think it's the next slide now that I'll tell you the main theorem and the hypotheses there. I'd like to think that his, um, that his uh, version does fit in there. But I, I don't know that. Uh, what is the Drinfeld co-center? So an object of the Drinfeld center is an object of, an object of the category phi together with a uh, kind of braiding, Oops. which is an isomorphism like this that's natural. Yeah, that's an object of the center. And an object of this co-center is a kind of twisted version of that braiding. Okay. All right, so now we come to the statement of the main theorem. And let me go through it slowly. So this first part are the hypotheses on C and F, F being a three-dimensional frame theory, C being the codomain or target category for that theory. And what are we assuming about C? Well, it's certainly a symmetric monoidal three category. That's part of the general theory. And the only thing we're going to assume is that its fully dualizable part here contains the fusion categories, meaning it contains the whole three category of fusion categories. That way, for example, the Toraya-Vero theories, which were on the last slide, which factor through the fusion categories are certainly included as possibilities for these Fs. But we want to allow, you know, a kind of flexible codomain so that all the Resch, Teek, and Turayev theories eventually will fit into this. And so what are the hypotheses we make then on the theory F that should characterize or be characteristic properties of a, Turayev, of a Resch, Teek, and Turayev theory, which are enough for us uh, in, this, in this theorem? So the first one is that when I evaluate on the zero sphere, that's the union of the plus point and its dual, the minus point, that we get some object of C, and that object of C is isomorphic to one in the small part of C, isomorphic to a fusion category. Okay, again, we're not assuming, by the way, simple unit as a technical remark. So this F of S naught is small in a sense. It's, it's isomorphic to a fusion category. And the main kind of characteristic property of a resch and Turayev theory is that its value on this bounding circle is a modular tensor category. And the way in this categorical framework to say it's a modular tensor category is to say that it's invertible as a braided tensor category. So this omega C, well, we don't really know about it, but its fully dualizable part is um, really the fully dualizable, it, it is, sorry, the loop category um, from one to one in fusion, which are these finite semi-simple abelian categories because we are assuming that the fusion categories are full. And so this is E2 on finite semi-simple categories. E2 of a category is a braided category. And in the four category, there are recent papers that prove that uh, a modular tensor category is invertible. So it's this invertibility that uh, we're going to assume. Okay, so those are the two hypotheses on F. And we had a hypothesis on C to make it plausible that it could be the target three category of such a theory. And now comes the main hypothesis. The main hypothesis is that we have a non-zero boundary theory. So again, having a non-zero boundary theory is encoded by having an extension of our original functor F of our original theory to this bordism category where we allow these colored boundaries, these coning off. And there's just one boundary theory here that we're using on the different boundaries. That's, those are the boundaries that will be colored in green. And you can think of the boundary theory as called beta. So I'll explain a little bit more later. But the key hypothesis is that that be non-zero. We have a non-zero one. And the conclusion is that then this modular tensor category is actually a Drinfeld center. It's the Drinfeld center, but of something small, of a fusion category, not of something bigger. 
And not only that, you can actually take the fusion category to have a simple unit. So in other words, um, various people that might be listening have defined a wit group of these modular tensor categories. And this says that the modular tensor category is zero in this wit group. So in a sense, it says that that wit group is a complete obstruction to having uh, a non-zero boundary theory. Why is it a complete instruction, uh, obstruction? Well, conversely, if we start with a fusion category, then I want to make a theory who's, um, with a boundary theory whose um, modular tensor category is the Drinfeld center. And we already saw we could make the Taraya Vero theory. And the boundary theory is constructed by viewing phi as a module over itself, as a kind of regular left module. OK. So I'll pause here for questions about the theorem. I see there was some chat, but I don't think I have to answer. Thank you, Noah. So any questions? So in the slogan, what the theorem says is, if you have a resh tekin of theory, which has a non-zero boundary theory, then it must be a Taraya Vero theory. We don't quite prove that statement because of the gradings that you would need for a spin, structure, uh, spin theories and so on. But loosely speaking, that's what the theorem says. Hey Dan, this is David Ayala. I have a question. Sure. Could you say a word about where phi naught comes from, given the above data? Yeah, that's what I'm going to explain. OK, great. Yeah, so one of the main parts of the proof is precisely to construct phi naught. That's exactly right, from this data. So that's what I'll explain. Hi, Dan. This is Victor Lostrick. So, so is there something about spherical structures in this story? Or, I mean, ah, very good question. No, there's nothing about spherical structures. So uh, it's a conjecture as far as I know, unproved, that every fusion category admits a spherical structure. I'm but, yeah. <laughs> right, but we're not, we're not using that. So our theories are all defined on frame manifolds. Mm -hmm. If we have a spherical awesome. structure, it could factor through to oriented manifolds. Mm -hmm. But we're not addressing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, hey, Dan, this is Kevin Walker. I have a question. Sure. Um, so it's, it's frequently said amongst condensed matter physics people that, you know, these chiral theories don't have gapped boundaries and these fresh um, Taraya Vero type ones do. And they sort of regard that as some sort of an infinity of statement. So can I take your theorem to be some, some way of making that precise? Yes, and I'll comment on that in a second. Thanks. Exactly. That's right. Other questions? Okay, so let me move on before we discuss, answer David's question about how do you construct this phi naught. Um, let me give you two, um, well, applications might be a way to say it, but the first one is really another theorem, which we prove in a sense on the way to this theorem. And that theorem has nothing to do with boundary theories or anything. It's an application to just tensor categories. Namely, it's a characterization of fusion categories. So I've already told you this theorem of Douglas, Douglas Schomer, Priest, and Snyder that fusion categories are three dualizable, and even better, that this three category has all the adjoints and so on. And so what we prove here is a, uh, if you like, a kind of converse, which says the following, that supposing we start with a tensor category, and remember that for us, a tensor category is an algebra object inside uh, our particular choice of the two category of categories. But we're not assuming simple unit. We're not assuming any kind of rigidity. So then phi is a fusion category, if and only if what? Two things have to hold. One, and this is a characterization in terms of you know, just categorical notions, these finiteness notions of dualizability. So one is that phi is three dualizable as an object inside this three category of tensor categories. And it's also two dualizable as a left module. So phi is of course an algebra. Any algebra is a module over itself, say on the left. And we might call that the regular left phi module. 
if you think of the case of the group algebra of a finite group, that's essentially the regular representation. So you could think of this as the regular phi module. And that has to be dualizable in the sense of having all the adjoints that it can. So, so the fact that a fusion category satisfies these two, as I said, is the theorem of Douglas, Schomer, Priest, and Snyder. And what we want to do is prove the converse, that if we have an object in here, which is three dualizable as an object, two dualizable as a one morphism, meaning as a module over itself, then in fact, it has to be a fusion category. Okay. Right, so just to show you what's not a fusion category, but is still a tensor category, here's an example. So this is um, an algebra that you might call the dual, dual numbers. Uh, if you want to think of it geometrically, you can think that it's, uh, what is its spec? What are its points? It, its spec is really um, just a kind of abstract tangent vector. That's what this is. And we want to take the tensor category of AA by modules, which is the same as A tensor A op left modules, say. And so those are, in a sense, sheaves over um, this abstract tangent vector across itself. Okay. Now, that's not a, um, a fusion category. And so that doesn't satisfy this, this theorem. But you can think of it as deforming. This is, in a sense, a kind of specialization of a family where we take C adjoin X modulo uh, X times X minus epsilon. And what is spec of that? Well, spec of that is two points. And so if I take that cross itself to look at the bimodules, then we get four points, of course. And the vector bundles over those four points, that's just the two by two matrices of vector spaces that I showed you before. So that fusion category, in a sense, specializes to this one. This one is still Merida trivial, so it satisfies the first of the two conditions. It's three dualizable, but it's not dualizable as a module. So this is just an example to get into the theorem a little bit. Okay. And I just want to advertise that, you know, in this kind of work that uh, uses the, the field theory and the geometry and topology in low dimensions to study this algebra, that it's very useful to look at this regular phi module and this idea of a boundary theory. And not only that, but um, any time you want to study a module category, you can look at the associated field theory as long as that module category satisfies the right finiteness conditions to have such a field theory. And so that's actually a useful tool in just studying the algebra of these things. And this theorem is an example of that. Okay. So now I want to turn to the Kevin's question, which is, uh, was one of the motivations was an application to physics. And so here you want to think of um, the idea of insulating and conducting materials that's illustrated here. This is a material that's two dimensional. So the associated kind of physics that describes it is two plus one dimensional, two space plus one time. So that's the case we're looking at. Here's a picture of something three plus one dimensional. And one would like in this game materials which are insulating in the bulk, but conduct on the boundary. And in fact, that the conduction is forced on the boundary. So that's the question. When is this conduction forced on the boundary, which Kevin articulated very nicely. And this theorem that we proved, the, first, the main one, uh, gives a criterion for that. This idea of the modular tensor category being a Drin, uh, Drinfeld center. But of course, as with any application, you have to make some jumps to see why that theorem applies to this kind of problem. So let me just very quickly say what kind of argument you might make, but it's not, again, a mathematical argument. It's an argument about applying math to some situation external. So in quantum mechanics, as we already saw, we have a Hilbert space of states and a Hamiltonian. And in any quantum system, whether it be quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, string theory, whatever, there's a basic dichotomy, which is called um, gapped versus gapless. And gap refers to a spectral gap, 
a gap in the spectrum, and it's the spectrum of energies in the theory. That is to say, the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. So here I've just drawn, assuming that the Hamiltonian is bounded below, say by zero, then I've drawn a picture of the spectrum in red in the real line. And uh, this first one is a picture where the spectrum is gapped. That means zero is a discrete point, an eigenvalue of finite multiplicity in the spectrum. And in the second case, there's continuous spectrum on down to zero. So those, that's a basic dichotomy. And there's an ansatz that often applies, it doesn't universally apply, that says that if you have a quantum mechanical system and you want to look at low energy, which um, is dual to small time, that's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and in a relativistic system, that's small distances, then uh, you can approximate it well by a scale invariant quantum field theory. Now that's not universal, there are lots of counterexamples, that's not the discussion for today, but many systems do obey this. This is a kind of reflex that many physicists use. And furthermore, that if your quantum mechanical system is gapped, that at the very low energy, it's described by a topological field theory. There's a slight amendment to that that won't concern us today. And that's how we get from these gapped systems. Well, gapped means insulating, no conduction. So that's what we wanted on the previous slide, right? We wanted that in the uh, bulk here, the system is insulating, it doesn't conduct, and that's therefore a gapped system. So that's what should be described at low energy by our F, by our uh, topological field theory. And so if it's gapped, then what it says is that the bulk is described by this three-dimensional theory. If there happened to be a gapped boundary theory, some kind of boundary situation also with no conduction, then when you apply that same principle to the boundary theory, you go to very low energy, that too should be described by a topological field theory. And the relation with the bulk is exactly this boundary theory that I'm talking about. And of course, it should be non-zero if we have an actual theory there and our theorem rules that out for some Fs. And therefore, that's how you might use it as an argument to say that no matter what you do on the boundary, you'll always have conduction in certain of these systems. So anyway, I don't want to belabor that point, but that uh, is one possible application of this theorem. So in, in many situations, physicists make arguments like this, certainly in quantum Hall systems, but they use arguments that are specific to the detailed description of the theory. This is, of course, a more topological argument, and therefore a more general, more robust kind of argument. Again, with the caveat that you have to accept the jumps that make it apply. So I'll stop for questions since I'm going to change directions now. Okay. So I want to talk about a preliminary to um, explaining a little bit about how the theorem is proved. And the first one, of course, are these Bordism multi-categories, these Bordism categories that we use. So we're going to make arguments that trade off back and forth between the geometry of these Bordisms and the higher algebra of these tensor categories. So of course, we have to know what these Bordism categories are, what these objects are. And there are lots of papers. Um, here's just a few. I think um, Chris Schomer Priest and others have written uh, certainly with rigorous and detailed constructions of the higher Bordism categories. All that we're going to do is just give a description in the paper of what the objects look like, not the detailed construction. And um, we'll do it in such a way that it's easy to manipulate when you want to make arguments like this. And um, one feature of the way that uh, we like to do it is that we don't have a global time function. So to actually construct the category, you have to interpret these Bordisms as maps from here to here. If there were one morphism and if it's a two morphism, a more complicated picture. And it's very convenient to map your whole Bordism down to a little figure that encodes that kind of categorical uh, shape. But that's a, kind of global time, like a global Morse function, or really several Morse functions on your manifold. And 
both for the convenience of manipulating and also even philosophically, if you think about the physics, the only time you really have is at the boundaries and the corners. And so we're going to use uh, definitions that do that. So I'm not going to spell out a rigorous, you know, dense slide of definitions, but at least I'll tell what's the, what are the parameters. So N is the dimension of the theory. It's an N-dimensional theory. K is telling that we have a K-morphism. And D is the depth. So this K-morphism is a K-dimensional manifold, which if the depth is zero, it's just a closed manifold. So in fact, it's a compact K-dimensional manifold. And if it has depth zero, it has no boundary or corners, so it's a closed manifold. If it has depth one, then we're allowed to have kind of depth one boundary, which means the usual boundary. So that's a compact manifold with boundary. If it has depth two, then we're allowed the first level of corners. And depth three, we're allowed deeper corners and so on. Okay. So <clears throat> there are several notions in differential uh, topology of manifolds with corners, some variant definitions, but these, uh, objects and morphisms in the Bordism category come with a lot of extra structure on the boundary. And that makes these um, manifolds with corners of whatever type you like, really. And that extra structure, I'll just indicate a little bit about it in the next slides with pictures. So we're interested in three-dimensional field theories, board three. But most of the pictures, in fact, live in the plane or are really in board two. Most of the objects and morphisms are in board two, and it's easier to explain in board two. So here's an object in board two, which is a point. Here's a one morphism like this. This is a one morphism that these red arrows indicate, um, these double headed red arrows indicate that P naught and P one are part of the domain of this one morphism and there's no boundary points in the codomain, so that goes to the empty manifold. And this is then, uh, this last figure is a two morphism. That's a manifold with corners, the most you can have in dimension two, of course. And here this, um, there are three kind of pieces of the boundary, these C's. This C naught, as you see by this arrow, is outgoing. So that C naught appears here in the bordism. The C1 and C2 are incoming because of those two arrows. And um, so they appear in the domain of the two morphism. So these arrows are what I like to call arrows of time. And you can think of them a little bit here by really you should think of an object in the Bordism category as being a point or being a zero manifold, but embedded inside at least a germ of a one manifold, which in turn is embedded inside a two manifold. And that's what's meant to be indicated. This one morphism is a one manifold with boundary. And it in turn should be thought of as sitting in a germ, a germ of a uh, two manifold. Now, if you're actually doing a field theory with continuous parameters like Riemannian metrics, you would need these germs. But in the topological situation, all that you need to remember from the germ is just the tangential information. And that means that even though this uh, point, for example, here is a zero dimensional manifold, we should regard its tangent bundle as rank two. And not only that, it comes in a sense filtered or graded if you like by um, the different co-dimensions. And that's what these kinds of arrows are meant to indicate orientations of those uh, successive normal bundles of one sort of stratum inside the next. So those orientations are really arrows of time. So for example, here in this one morphism, in this one morphism, we have this arrow of time leading nowhere. But when that one morphism is sitting inside a two morphism, then that arrow of time is telling us that in this case, for example, C1 is part of the domain of that two morphism. Yeah. So that's what these arrows mean. And um, again, I'm just going to say enough so that you can follow the pictures, I'm not going to say any more. The other thing perhaps to comment on are these dotted lines here. And these dotted lines you can think of as constancy. 
it's telling us that P naught, which has co-dimension two inside this uh, two, two morphism, that has to appear in the boundary cross an interval. And that's what appears on these two ends. And in a sense, that's just collapsing data. And if you collapse that, then of course it has the shape of a loon, which is the shape of a two morphism. But in terms of manifold with corners, it will be, so to speak, expanded out. All right. So as I said, there's a definition that goes behind this with a lot of structure that tells you, you know, this kind of partition of the boundary into the various co-dimension pieces, the various piece, pieces of different depth. The subscript is telling you the depth of that part of the boundary. The superscript is telling you where, whether it's incoming or outgoing. And so you really would have data like that that would describe it. But I'm not going to go through that data uh, here. Okay, any questions about the meaning of this kind of arrow of time and so on? So again, I'll just emphasize that a picture like this is usually drawn um, is usually drawn bent over a kind of elbow with a global time going from left to right or up to down or what have you. And here we're allowing ourselves to just draw it straight, but just have the arrows uh, indicate that. But when you get to more complicated pictures, that turns out to be a lot more convenient. Small point, but a point of convenience for calculating, so to speak. Okay, so these bordisms can have tangential structures. There's a general discussion that I think in Bordism theory actually goes back to Lashov in the 60s of what we mean by a tangential structure, Dan Lashov that is. And um, the only, th so here we're using framings. So in board two, we would use two framings and F1, F2 are indicating the two vectors of our framing. And the only point I wanna emphasize is that the, um, that the tangent bundle, as I said, is always ranked two, no matter what dimension the manifold. So here on these, on these objects, um, we still have a two framing, even though the object itself is a zero manifold. And the other point to emphasize is that when we come to a boundary, there's no lining up of the tangential structure and the tangent bundle to the boundary. There's no such constraint. Well, there's a convention here, again, for the level of this talk, it's not important, but we're using board three. And so unless otherwise indicated, the third vector is just pointing into your screen. That's just a convention, but just to let you know that there really is a, a third one like that. Um, so one of the important points about the Bordism category is that all duals and adjoints exist. And that means when you have a functor out of it, a theory that forces that the image contains objects and morphisms that have all their duals and adjoints. And there's of course a prescription for writing the dual and the adjoint. So for example, here we have this plus point. So that's a convention about which framing we have and which orientation we have on those two extra directions. And we can get its dual, which is this minus point, simply by reversing the direction of that particular arrow. So that's the way you can get duals. You have to choose which depth arrow you want to invert. And that's what you do. It's a change of orientation. And quite generally, that gives you the duals. So here, for example, um, ah, this is the duality data that tells you that the plus and minus point are duals, the usual evaluation and co-evaluation, and the fact that the compositions in the, whatever you want to call it, the Zorro snake something diagram, that you get the identity, that's encoded by this, or witnessed, you might say, by this two morphism here. And so that's the usual kind of picture, but drawn in our conventions. Now, morphisms also have adjoints. And um, the prescription for an adjoint, whether it be a right or a left, which is what the superscript indicates, that's a little bit complicated. But here, anyway, is the picture for, uh, for E, which was the evaluation that is part of the duality data between the plus point and the minus point. Now we're thinking of this E here as itself a one morphism from the disjoint union of the plus point and the minus point to the empty zero manifold. And as a one morphism in this higher category, it 
can, and indeed in the Bordism category does, have both the right and the left adjoint. And what's pictured here are the right and left adjoint. So just roughly, you, you'd have to take a collar neighborhood of the boundary and you do something particular to the tangential structure. There's a particular two-dimensional subbundle there and you rotate 180 degrees the tangential structure in that subbundle. And that was what you see is going on here with that framing versus that one and the same on the other side. And for the left adjoint, there's a similar rotation, but the direction of the rotation is opposite. And then one has to do something uniform to the tangential structure in the interior. Anyway, there is some definite prescription for seeing what these adjoints are. The main point being that these adjoints exist and they can be easily calculated in the Bordism category. Okay. So the other aspect we need is the Bordism category that has these boundary, uh, that's the domain of a theory with the boundary uh, theory included. So again, it's in this field theory, from this kind of axiomatic point of view, it's a very geometric thing to put in the boundary. Again, a boundary in any context, in this PDE context, in this quantum field theory, is really coning off, a boundary theory cones off the boundary. It makes it as if the boundary isn't there. And here we literally, in the Bordism category, can do that. And so um, the objects, for example, in uh, this one, so this is again back to board two, zero, one, and two manifolds. They're going to be two framed, but now the, the, the symbol here means that we're including these colored boundaries. So you can see right away from the two morphisms, we don't, of course, have to color the whole boundary. Here, part of the boundary is colored green, but other parts of the boundary are not. Right? We're allowed to color pieces of the boundary. So the objects are the same. There's no boundary of a zero manifold, so there's no uh, extra uh, objects. But now a one morphism, which is a one manifold with boundary underlying the other data, we're allowed to color some components of the boundary with our boundary theory. So they're just indicated by the green color. So here, and we've seen this before, uh, when we talked in the second slide about quantum mechanics, here we have um, this one manifold with both ends colored, so it's as if it's a closed one manifold. So this is red in the, this Bordism category is a one morphism from the empty zero manifold. Let me write that. It maps the empty zero manifold to the empty zero manifold. Okay. So here's a two morphism, and this two morphism has two incoming pieces of the boundary here and here, and it has one outgoing piece of the boundary. And in fact, you can see that each incoming piece and the outgoing piece, these are diffeomorphic. So this makes this one morphism a map from phi naught to phi naught. So it's an object in the loops, if you like, on this Bordism category it shows you a multiplication on that object. It's part of the data of making that particular one morphism into an algebra object in the Bordism category. Well, again, this is just to show you that there is a definition behind these heuristics that, uh, you know, in terms of building up a manifold with corners, we, you know, th there's a definition that goes with it that tells you precisely what the objects and morphisms are in this Bordism category with boundary. Okay, so again, I'll switch tacks a little bit. So this is a good place to stop for questions. So could part, this is Peter, could part of the two dimensional thing, would, would, could, could it be green? Oh, maybe that's the example at the bottom. So you're coloring your bordisms in two colors, gray and green. Um, well, the green part is only in the boundary of the manifold with corners, right? That's important. We're not coloring oh, the interior. Oh. I see. I mean, it really is a boundary theory. It has to live on the boundary. So there's no coloring the interior. Uh -huh. So this would not include the usual open-close theories where you have like a... Ah, 
an invisible part of the story and then a visible part, which I was always thinking is two coloring the word is in a category. Okay, well, there are several variations that one can do. So one variation, and we'll see it in a minute, is we could have more than one boundary theory. In other words, we might have more than one color, so to speak, on the boundary. Yeah. Right. We could imagine certainly doing that. But we could also have a situation where instead of a single bulk theory, we have two bulk theories. So we might have two colors that we can color the interiors by. But then between them, we would need uh, you know, a generalization, if you like, of a boundary theory called the domain ball that I indicated earlier. Right. And the boundary theory is the case when one of those two interior theories is the trivial theory. So that's the case in which you can erase it. So certainly this is, you know, has many variations and generalizations, absolutely. Hey, uh, Dan, this is Chris from Mercury. I have a question about the, um, the framings on the boundary parts. Are they, like, a, like in the picture that you have with the two-dimensional um, morphism right there, yeah. So there's a framing on the boundary, but it looks, you know, like it's not changing. Is it also allowed to rotate as you move along part of the green boundary there? Ah, thank you. So I thank you for the question because I did neglect to say something. So I said that when we have a, um, well, I said it way back here. I said that in general, when we have a boundary that the um, tangential structure needn't align with the boundary. So if we're in n dimensions, we have an n minus one dimensional boundary, the tangent bundle has rank n all the way through. It's a rank n tangential structure, in this case of framing, and at the boundary, it does what it does. There's no constraint. However, when we have a boundary theory, then there is a constraint. And so you'll notice that uh, on all of these green dots, <laughs> right, everywhere there, you'll notice that the second, the shorter of the two frames always points in. So essentially that, that's a constraint. So with the boundary theory, you see the boundary theory is n minus one dimensional if we were in n dimensions. And the tangential structure that goes with it should be n minus one dimensional. And that's why we have to constrain the tangential structure that the last direction is trivial, so to speak. So in this framing case, You'll, you'll notice that. So the fact that this rotates around was forced on you in this two-dimensional case. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you very much for the question because I did not like to see Yeah, this. and so let's follow up then. In the three-dimensional case, right, that we're ah, looking yes. at, um, then you have more room, right, for it to mm -hmm. rotate in that case. Is that correct? Excellent, and we're going to use that in a minute. So in the three-dimensional case, that means that the tangential structure at these green boundaries is essentially two-dimensional, mm. but a framing in two dimensions can rotate. And yes, we will use that. Absolutely. Very good observation. Good. Other questions? Okay. So here's just a single slide with a, another preliminary, and I'm not going to belabor it. It's just fits in with the higher category kind of thing. Um, and it's a general uh, thing in, in two categories and higher categories, as Emily Real kindly explained to me, um, which is that it, it's a kind of internal hum, but that name should be ascribed to me if, if it's wrong, not to anyone else. Um, but essentially this uh, hom r is, if I have it straight, a right adjoint of left composition with f, and hom l is a left adjoint of right composition with f, something like that. In any case, um, we're only going to use this particular case of it, where we have um, f is a one morphism from x to y, and so its adjoints, of course, map from y to x, and therefore these compositions map either from x to x or y to y. And the point is these compositions are algebra objects. And that's of course very easy to see the algebra structure using the unit and co-unit of the adjunctions. And um, these algebras, it turned out in our argument, keep arising over and over, whether it be in the bordism category or in the target algebraic category. And it's just useful to frame the arguments to have these kind of uh, symbols around. That's all it is. But there is a theorem then, again, due to Douglas, uh, Schomer, Priest, and Snyder, that says um, 
inside fusion categories, and it applies more generally. But basically, a one morphism there is a bimodule, and the bimodule does have adjoints. And what do these endomorphism algebras turn out to be? They turn out to be what you would expect. They're endomorphism algebras of um, their endomorphisms of the module over one or the other of the algebras acting on it, depending on whether it's right or left. And then one has to worry about conventions, and I'm not going to go into that. But this theorem, the proposition tells us that this idea of endomorphisms, this general categorical idea, in the context of tensor categories and bimodule categories does specialize to what we want, at least with some finiteness around. Okay. So I've been going on for a long time. <laughs> and um, if you like, I can spend some more minutes and at least tell you part of the proof of the first theorem and essentially all of the proof of the second, which was, David, your question, where does phi naught come from? So let me um, remind you the shape of the main theorem, which is here. The shape of it is that we have a three-dimensional field theory, which is this F here. It has a codomain category C. And the only assumption we're making about C is that the fusion uh, categories as a three category sits inside the fully dualizable part. Then we're assuming that it has an extension with this boundary theory, which is non-zero. And the conclusion is that we want to say that there is a fusion category, which I'll call phi. The fact that you can take it with simple unit is a little lemma later on, but we'll just construct a fusion category, what's called uh, sometimes a multi-fusion category. We'll construct the fusion category out of this data, which was precisely David's question. How do you construct the fusion category out of this data? Then, of course, we have to prove more about it. Now, for this second theorem, which is the characterization of fusion categories, we're starting by assuming that we have a three-dualizable um, object called phi inside tensor category. So we have a tensor category that's fully dualizable, and it's two-dualizable as a regular module. And what we have to do is prove that this phi is actually a fusion category. Okay. So how is this second theorem seen in the setup of this first theorem? Well, I have to tell you what C is. And so, um, right, so to apply this, we take C to be just uh, tensor categories. Well, that satisfies the hypothesis, right? It contains fusion categories inside, so that's good. And what do we take F to be? F is the Torai of Vero theory whose value on a point is our given phi. Why do we know that exists? Because of the hypothesis that phi is three dualizable. So that's an application again of the cobordism hypothesis. And now we need to give this extension F tilde, that's the other application of the cobordism hypothesis where um, we take, so to speak, beta of plus to be phi as a left phi module. Maybe I'll just indicate it like that as the regular module. And the fact that this boundary theory is too dualizable, that, that phi is too dualizable inside there is precisely telling you that you get such a three-dimensional theory. Okay. So, so that's how we uh, are up, get to this setup from the hypotheses here. And now what we have to do is prove this phi is um, a fusion category. Well, I'm going to show you in the context of this theorem how to produce a fusion category. And the only thing left to say is that the formula I'll show you for that fusion category is precisely phi. So the one we'll produce up here is the phi that we start with here. And we're going to be proving that it's fusion. So let me end by sketching that argument because that illustrates this interplay between as I said, the geometry of the Bordism category, but now including this boundary uh, theory, so these boundaries on the, on the Bordisms uh, and the algebra of tensor categories. So let's see. Okay, so again, I'm going to assume that we're in this situation. 
And most of the work is just in the Bordism category. So I don't need to know anything about C almost, a little bit, but we have a theory defined on that. So now I'll draw this um, one morphism, which is something we've already seen, right? This is the morphism that goes from empty to empty because of the uh, green points, right? And um, this is an example of this end construction, a right. It's the right adjoint composed with uh, the F in some order. And so here's a picture of the F plus. This is now a one morphism. This one goes from the empty zero manifold to the plus point, and its adjoint goes from the plus point back to the empty. And so their composition in that order is what we have here. That was an illustration, an indi instance of this general construction. And the general construction tells you that we have to get an algebra object. So this one morphism inside the Bordism category is an algebra object. An algebra object where inside, well, this Bordism, this um, Bordism category, well, we're just taking loops is really the way to write it. Board three framed with the boundary. So it's an algebra object in there. Okay. And here, for example, is the picture we saw before. This is the two morphism, which is the multiplication. But that picture itself follows from the general theory of what this end R is. It just tells you how to construct it from the unit and co-unit that exhibit this as the right adjoint of this. So once you know that, you automatically draw that picture. It's just a general kind of thing. There's no choice. And there's a similar unit that goes with it. Uh, I don't see the picture here. But what is phi? So we're going to define phi to be the image in our extended theory of this Bordism. And remember that this lives in this, um, th this Bordism lives in loops of the domain category. And therefore, F tilde of it lives in loops of the codomain category and those are categories. So we know we get a category out of this. And in fact, because the image of the theory has to live in the fully dualizable part, um, you know, we're going to know automatically that we get a finite semi-simple abelian category. Now here I should make a remark that in this theorem, yeah, we get a, a we, we get into the, um, well, we get into omega C, which by these hypotheses has to be uh, the finite semi-simple abelians. In this theorem, we're going to loosen it up. We're not going to assume this business about the full subcategory. So if we're trying to prove this theorem, we don't want to assume that that's finite semi-simple abelian. We want to prove that, and that's fine. Okay. So here, kind of echoing Peter's uh, la last question, is a slight generalization where we have two different kinds of boundary theories. We have the green one, which is our basic one, but we also have a blue one. And I'm going to think that the boundary theory we put on the green is the one we started with, but the boundary theory on this uh, light blue is its right adjoint as a boundary theory. Now, why do I want that? Well, you see, when I go across here, this framing rotates. And the reason it rotates, well, one reason it rotates is because it's the composition of F with its right adjoint. And I told you the general prescription for adjoints in the Bordism category involves a rotation near the boundary. And so that's where it comes from. It also rotates because of, it has to because of this rule that the last framing vector has to point in. And there's no way it can be constant and point in. But if I take the adjoint boundary theory, that goes not from one to my theory F, but in the other direction from F to one. And so this last framing vector needs to point out rather than in. And therefore this is a valid um, one morphism in the Bordism category where I now have two boundary theories where the framing doesn't at all rotate. In other words, that framing is essentially a one framing, not a two framing. And that's good. First of all, you can check that these two evaluate to the same phi. They both evaluate to phi just by the definition of this composition. But 
then you can think about a dimensional reduction of the theory. You see, we can make a functor out of board two, where for every object and morphism in board two, I simply take the Cartesian product with this and get something in board three. And these board two, these are two framed. So it's important this be one framed so that I get into three framed board. Well, once I do that, I know I get a theory. So I get a map into cat C, it's a theory. Therefore, the value on a point has to be uh, too dualizable in the target. Well, its value on the point is the value in my original theory of this, which is phi. And I quoted a theorem earlier that said the two dualizable objects are exactly the finite semi-simple categories, abelian categories. So that's how we prove that phi, just defined from pictures, if you like, that phi is finite semi-simple abelian. So that's part of being fusion. Any questions about that? I think there's just one more slide, roughly. Okay. So the other part we have to prove, we know that it's an algebra object. It's a tensor category. We know that it's finite semi-simple abelian. We have to prove that it has internal duals. And so here's a general discussion that um, you know, I think appears in different places. For example, in a recent paper of, I'm not going to get it right, Brochier, uh, David Jordan, um, and Noah Snyder, possibly with Pavel Safranov, I forgot which paper. But anyway, uh, there are different versions of this, I think, in literature. We give such a discussion. And uh, what we want to prove is this lemma that this phi is rigid. That's the other piece to say that it's a fusion category. Well, so here again is a picture of the multiplication that we get on this uh, algebra. Again, that's from general principles in the Bordism category. And similarly, from general principles, we get the unit, which works out to be this disk, this disk. Okay, well, those have right adjoints. And again, that's just because everything in the Bordism category has adjoints. So here, by the rule, is pictured the right adjoint of uh, the unit, and here is pictured the right adjoint of the multiplication. And now to uh, Chris's point, Shomer Priest's point, when we make this right adjoint, we see that the frame rotates out of the plane. So this is the one place where we're going to use the full force of having three framings, which is again reflecting of some stronger finiteness in the algebra of the codomain, but we're using it here in the domain. So this one is meant to be rotating up, this one is meant to be rotating in, and there are similar uh, rotations out of the plane there. Again, from the general formula for adjoints in the Bordism category. Anyhow, these adjoints exist, and so you see we have a unit, and in a sense a co-unit, a multiplication, and a co-multiplication. So you can think of that as a kind of Frobenius data. And you make, as usual, this bilinear pairing on phi by composing the multiplication here, which has these coming in, with, uh, did I say that right? With, the, um, with this uh, co-unit, right? So we just put this flipped on the top like that. And that then gives you this bilinear form. And here are the kind of uh, transposes of the bilinear form, if you like, maps from phi to phi uh, dual. And the theorem is that, um, that, that the finite semi-simple tensor category is rigid if, well, if this bilinear pairing is non-degenerate, non-degenerate in the sense that these maps F are equivalences, isomorphisms. That's the usual kind of notion of non-degeneracy. And the second condition is that this co-multiplication, if you like to call it that, this right adjoint of multiplication is a bimodule map for the outer actions. So these are exactly kinds of conditions that tell you in a sense that phi is a Frobenius algebra. This is really a kind of categorified version. And so this says that that's what uh, rigidity means. And once you have that algebraic uh, lemma that tells you, or theorem that tells you this form of rigidity, then um, you can just make picture proofs because you have to check that this F and this F check are isomorphisms. Well, you just have to draw what they are. They're images of, um, in this case, two morphisms in the Bordism category. Here they are. This is the rectangle that gives F. That's the one that gives F check. And 
they're just a rectangle and the framings rotate. So it's obvious that you can rotate back to get the inverse. So these very obviously have inverses in the Bordism category. Therefore, under the functor, you get the invertibility that you need. And similarly, to verify that something is a bimodule, well, it's the usual kind of picture you get for associativity, which is uh, living there. And so putting those pieces together, you get that phi is a fusion category. So I think I should stop there. From, from here, uh, to prove the main theorem, you have to prove that you, know, you get this Drinfeld center. Well, once you have a fusion category, you get another three-dimensional theory of Turaya Vero type. And now you can play those off. And there are more slides, but I think I'll stop there. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dan, for that great talk. Are there any questions out there? Uh, wow, well, I lost track of it. This is John Francis. I lost track a little bit of the semi-simplicity. Was that something that you just imposed as a condition or did you see it in the proof? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, <clears throat> let me... Uh, Yeah, so um, there are two theorems, and in a sense, the answer is a little bit different for each theorem. So for the main theorem, the one about boundary theories and Rashtik and Turaev theories have them non-zero, if it's a Turaev-Vero theory, roughly. We assume that this um, codomain three category has fusion categories inside, but as a full subcategory. And the fullness there means that, for example, if I have something in the loops, then that's automatically finite semi-simple abelian, right? So there we built it in. But, you know, that's maybe a little bit stronger than we need in the statement of the theorem. And we certainly don't want to build it into this theorem because we want to say that this dualizability here implies, among other things, finite semi-simple abelian. And so there um, we don't build it in, but we prove it by that dimensional reduction argument. So it may be that you know, the first theorem is not quite stated in its optimal form, we're still tinkering. So maybe it can be stated in a way that makes it clear there is that argument with the dimensional reduction. But at least for that example, that's produced there. But there are other places where we look at certain modules over these fusion categories inside C and we wanna know those modules really are also finite semi-simple abelian to apply some of the algebraic theory. So that fullness assumption may be used other places. Does that answer, John? Yeah, thanks. Sure. Uh, I do have a, a David Reuter. I have a quick question to something you alluded to sort of in the very beginning. Um, okay. And which sort of the theorem somehow suggests a bit is like, do you see or do you expect a version of this theorem where you don't actually have to be fully extended, where you don't have to be fully dualizable? And in the sense that this symmetric node three category is sort of almost chunk and you only ever work in loops of C for sort of the real things somehow. Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, <clears throat> you know, we're leaning on the cobordism hypothesis to work with these theories. And, um, you know, you know from other work of, say, Chris Schomer Priest and Chris Douglas and their collaborators that when you work with just a one, two, three theory, for example, then, you know, it becomes much more complicated. The, the, the Bordism category is not free on a single generator. So <clears throat> working with those theories becomes more complicated. I could envision that you could make a presentation with generators and relations of the one, two, three Bordism category, including these boundaries. That would look pretty complicated and intricate one would imagine and perhaps prove a theorem using uh, you know, some character, some presentation of the one, two, three boardism category with boundaries that way. But I don't know how to do that. That's an excellent question. Um, sort of a quick question. So I remember uh, what we, you know, what, what are the, uh, what I, the first time I met you, I think uh, you pointed out that uh, if you take R to be a non-semi-simple ring and look at R, R bimodules, that's Morita equivalent to VEX, so it should still be three dualizable. 
uh, that's a good example of something that's three dualizable, but uh, the boundary is exactly what fails. Is that is that right? That's why that doesn't. Yes. Uh, yeah. So so in particular, uh, this theorem is sort of like manifestly non Morita invariant because the boundary itself <laughs> changes when you apply some kind of Morita equivalence. Is that right? Yes. And <clears throat> I mean, asking that, you know, asking that something be dualizable as a module is imposing a further finiteness condition. So here I'm going to get in trouble, but you might imagine that you could make some kind of two category of algebras where not only finite matrix algebras are part of it, but perhaps the algebra of compact operators on a Hilbert space is also in there. And you might think that if you do it correctly, that the compact operators on a Hilbert space would be, um, uh, would be Morita equivalent, Morita trivial. But you know, if you ask that it be as a left module dualizable in finite dimensions, that's basically the finite dimensionality of the column vectors, right? But if you do it for the compact operators, it wouldn't be. So again, I don't know technically how to make that example correct, but it's just an illustration. This is one higher categorical number version, but just an illustration of the additional finiteness that is encoded by this boundary. And that's why it's a useful tool as I'm suggesting for, for algebra. And I guess as a follow-up remark on that, uh, sort of there's a, there's a parallel story up a dimension where presumably the same thing happens where, so we just had this paper about how you don't need semi-simplicity for braided tensor categories, but presumably there's some sort of similar story about boundaries. Well, I can only recommend this as a way to investigate that. I have no, yeah, we haven't looked at the braided case, but that would be a great thing to do. And hopefully a useful tool for that, yeah. Um, this is Kevin. I, I have a question. Sure. At the end, you said you might have some slides that show pictures for relating phi to the Drinfeld center. Possible to flash those on the screen briefly. <laughs> sure. Um, yes. So here's the main theorem again. And the only thing I've added is I've given a name to uh, that. I mean, so far I haven't used these two hypotheses, right? But now we're going to need to use them. And um, right, so f of s naught, as we say, is perhaps not equal, but isomorphic to a, a fusion, whoops, that shouldn't be multi, a fusion category. And so here's the A that, um, that it is. And so, okay, so here are some more <laughs> bordisms again. So this is now a uh, one morphism, uh, but this is already without the green colors, it's there. That's the evaluation. So it gives you a map like this. And again, by this fullness condition, you can see that that one evaluates to a left A module category with appropriate finiteness. And similarly here, we have the F plus that we use to make phi, and then we have the F minus, which is going to the value on the minus point. So this maps to the zero sphere. We get a right A module category. And we use these module categories to make some read equivalences. That's what these module categories let you do. Of course, you have to prove some things about them in decomposability of the tensor algebra, these kinds of things, which follow. That's where the invertibility hypothesis comes in. And um, you wanted me to flash, I'm flashing. So <laughs> this phi, which is the image of this entire boardism, it exactly decomposes into this evaluation, cut out the middle, and then the F plus and F minus, and that translates into this tensor product presentation of phi. And therefore, endomorphisms of M that commute with A, which again was one of the examples of these end R and end L constructions, you see those act on phi commuting with the stuff that commutes with N. And so by the time you do that, you do get the map you want, and you have to prove, well, it's not hard to prove that's an equivalence, because tensoring with n is a Morita equivalence. And so you see that's an equivalence, and then you have to check braiding and so on. So uh, that, Kevin, is a flash. Okay, thanks. But that, that tells you the level of ideas, if you like, to go into it. So it's a little bit more argument. A few new characters get introduced from some particular 
morphisms in the Bordism category and then leaning on some of the algebraic theory of the tensor categories about Marie equivalences. And the theorems, as I say, worked out, for example, by uh, Douglas Schomer, P. Snyder, and so on to, to make the arguments. Hey, Dan, this is David. Um, if you could go to the slide that introduces fee. Uh, yes. That one? Um, the, the one that states the main theorem about phi, I guess. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. I think that's good. You want the one so, that really has the whole theorem? Well, uh, I'll ask the question. We can see where to go from there. Okay, sure. So um, the construction of phi was nearly canonical. It depended, you know, it, it came by this dimensional reduction along this, um, this certain endomorphism of, of empty. Uh, as you explained, so that dimensional reduction depends on how to uh, how to regard the framing of that one-dimensional interval as a three-framing, and there is potentially a multitude of ways of doing that. And and so uh, I imagine then that in the that this results in some symmetries of the th theory uh, because the the statement of the main theorem that I was wondering if we could look at. Uh, says that it is the Drinfeld center of something, and that something has has some symmetries to it. So my question is if those symmetries might have been expected otherwise, or if you could speak to them generally. Well, um, let me at least put the right slide there. I guess it's that one. And yeah. um, well, I don't think I can speak off the cuff to that very intelligently. I, I will just say that, um, you know, if I think of the Bordism category with framings, for example, here a three framed point, there's a whole, right. so to speak, SO3 or O3 torsor of three frame, well, say SO3 torsor of three frame plus points. And they're all different objects. They're all isomorphic. Space right. is not contractible. But you wouldn't say that you have a symmetry of any one of them. I mean, the SO3, of course, permutes them. Yeah, so therein is my question. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, my initial reaction to what you're saying, you have this, uh, this interval with a particular framing. Yes, there are other ways we could rotate the framing. We've made a particular choice, or at least a choice up to some nice, well, yeah. We've made some particular choice up to some contractible space of isotopies. You could take sure. those pictures, how fast you rotate, so to speak. Sure. But, um, yeah, but if you made a different choice of the kind I think you're thinking of, you really get a different object. And so you get something under the theory isomorphic to phi, but you would have to give an isotopy of framings to make it. Yeah, that's right. I, I think I, I confused the layers. Yeah, that's right. No, okay. So I'm not sure that you get any particular symmetry oh, out of That's out of right. It. Yeah, I was confused. Okay, thanks. Are there any um, other questions out there? Well, yeah, it's Alexey Davidov. Could I ask again about the cosenta definition? Um, sure. Could you say it again? Yeah. So as I'm finding the slide where I wrote it, I uh, will um, remind that that definition only comes into uh, to the case when you have these spin kinds of churn symbols. But mm -hmm. I guess I wrote it on this slide here. So, um, well, maybe I'll just write it here. Yeah, so if we have this uh, tensor category, what should I call it? Um, phi, I've been calling it. Then the center of phi consists of pairs, right? Consisting of an object X and maybe a braiding, where X is an object of phi and beta is a kind of functor that... Um, and if you're writing, I, I cannot see it. Yeah, nice no, but... Well, that's very strange. Um, of course, I just turned off my iPad by mistake, so give me a second. Um, really? Okay. Um, I don't know why that happened, but um, I'll write it here. You can't see that either. Okay. 
Give me one second. These are the technical difficulties for which David asked your forbearance at the beginning of the talk. <clears throat> ah, now you can see. Mm -hmm. Very good. So, uh, yeah, so this Grinfeld center consists of these pairs where we have an object and we have beta, which is an isomorphism of left tensor with X and right tensor with X and their conditions and so on, yeah? And so what I'm saying is that for the uh, co-center, I forgot what word we, I don't know, star, co-center, we just put the double dual there. So it doesn't braid. Oh, double dual. X, oh, okay. Gotcha. But it's double dual. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, maybe I could have answered quicker, but that's, yeah. Yeah, thanks so much. Sure. All right, any other questions? So we're all invited to the tea room. I put a link for it in the chat right here um, for any more informal discussion. So thanks again, Dan, for that great talk. Thank you.